I am, you know, at my core sort of a simple pediatrician, and uh, as sort of I get started, I bring a view from the, the pointy end of the stick, the providers uh, who are tasked with taking the metric universe that we create and really driving actions on it. And so I, as I get started with uh, some thoughts about how that impacts doctors and nurse practitioners, nurses and MAs across Western North Carolina, uh, I'd like to first say thank you. Uh, I've sat in sessions for the last two days with uh, the superb track lead, Julia, in three, and I've heard words that I never knew existed, things like L3 structure and CDS hooks. Um, I have no clue, after a day and a half, still what they mean, uh, but what I know is that you know what they mean. You know, we, we live at a, a strategy level in terms of trying to drive quality improvement, and it's the work of folks like you. Uh, there's someone on my team named Christina who can recite the HEDIS manual verbatim um, and knows exactly what every one of those CDS hooks actually connects to. And so I'm, as the, the doctor on the other side of that, I'm incredibly grateful for the work that you do and wanted to thank you for that. So jumping in, uh, a couple of conflicts to disclose, but nothing that should impact any of the content that we talk about. I want to briefly touch on four things. And recognizing that uh, I'm the only thing left between you and returning to those work groups, and I've never seen such energy in work groups when it takes track leads to break up folks you know, who are, are literally standing between them and booze, you know that there is a lot of energy in the room. So I, th this has been a, a wild conference for me to be a part of. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, mission. I'll talk a lot about metrics. Uh, and then I'll touch on what I think we can do about it uh, and then why we should really be doing something about it. So with that in mind, uh, Mission uh, lives in Western North Carolina. Uh, our bigger aim was grounded by our CEO, Dr. Paulus, uh, when he came to Mission in 2010, and that's to get every patient to their desired outcome, uh, every person to their desired outcome, first without harm, also without waste, and with a superlative experience. Uh, that's, that's what we're around for. And in the course of the last seven years, uh, we have grown tremendously uh, in those we serve. Uh, you can see we started at four hospitals eight years ago. We're now uh, 10, including our post-acute facilities. Um, Dr. Barr noted we're about 1.8 billion in revenue, and we cover uh, the westernmost 18 counties of North Carolina. And we do so as a top 15 health system ranked by Truven for the last uh, six of the last seven years. Uh, we have a number of critical access facilities, and we're proud that our quality stands, uh, stands up in those critical access facilities uh, just as high as it does across the rest of the system. Uh, the population that we serve uh, includes a payer mix that is about 75% Medicare, Medicaid, and self-pay. Uh, they're proportionally poorer, sicker, less likely to be insured than state or national averages, and they live in some of the most rural and toughest parts of Appalachia uh, to find employment today. At, uh, at Asheville, our self-pay payer mix is around 5 to 6%, but when you get out north and east, I serve on the board of Blue Ridge Hospital, you can see up near, near Mitchell County, they're more like 11 or 12%. And there are parts of, of that county where uh, your employment option is work in the mine or you don't work. We have a, a pretty significant primary care footprint. Uh, our ACO uh, and clinically integrated network covers about 100,000 lives. We've got 120 primary care providers that we employ. And then a CIN that has about another 250 who are totally independent. And these are mom and pop, you know, one or two doc shops who are way up there in Burnsville and Marion, who are way out in Franklin. Uh, who play in our network in part because we have the QI infrastructure needed to help them survive the current state of, of pay for value. So let's talk a little bit about what that current state looks like for us. So again, we've got an employed group of about 900 docs. I've got one large acute general hospital, about 800 beds. I've got four critical access hospitals, a rehab hospital, a small general hospital, it's about 30 beds, uh, and then our CIN. And so we're gonna work our way through uh, what it takes for us to staff to the metrics that we create across that health system. And I'd ask you to keep your eyes on the top corner here. That's the total number of metrics that we've covered and the total number of people who I employ just to help run the metric universe. Not to drive improvement off of those metrics, but just to measure and report them. And so we start with uh, the universe of metrics that CMS controls. And so not, not really NCQA HL7, but these are just my regulatory metrics across six hospitals. And you can see just in the bucket of IQR, so inpatient quality reporting, what we have to staff 
to report today is 181 metrics, and it takes eight people. Those eight people are largely nurses, because when you get into thinking about these kind of metrics, they are not simple. So I've got eight clinical analysts who are dedicated to driving charts today and report these metrics to CMS. One of them is CEP1. How many of you are familiar with the CEP1 core metric set? I see a handful of hands. You know how many elements live in CEP1? That many. It can take one of my nurses four hours just to abstract a single patient. And that is in part because the timestamps are never totally accurate. The way our EMR is built in order to find exactly what time a diagnosis was made, when fluids were started, when a lactate was reordered, that takes an enormous amount of manual driving. And it's for the right reasons, right? We know sepsis is a major killer in the US. We know we need to get better at it. And we know that it's really hard to understand, but this is what it actually looks like and what it takes to drive just measuring it, not even drive improvement. So let's move on. Moving on from the universe of CMS, we get to NHSN. Those are all of my infection prevention <laughs> metrics. And these are eight buckets of healthcare-associated infections. Uh, seven of them are mandatory, and then there are those that we track and follow and report on electively uh, because that's, that's what we want to do. We want to deliver on our bigger aim. These carry a minimum of 20 data points each. Has anybody in the room seen a definition from NHSN? How many pages? <laughs> he says it depends what version. CLABC is 29 pages. Surgical site infections are 34 pages long. And so I've got two folks, two and a half actually, whose entire job is to go in and figure out how to report these metrics. And it's not just a one-time deal. They get a little bit subjective. So we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with NHSN on an infection that, say, develops in a baby, but they had a pneumonia, and do they consider it a CLABC or do they not consider it a CLABC? Two and a half full-time people, and now we're up to 307 metrics. That's what it looks like. You'll notice that my font gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And obviously, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but just get a sense of how many X's are there. That is somebody going into charts every single day just to report a metric. Moving on. I have a number of claims-based metrics that I don't hire abstractors to submit, but I still have to know what they are before CMS tells me what they are. And so this is what that universe looks like. 34 in IQR, 9 in OQR, which is the outpatient quality reporting. 2 in IPFQR, because I have a 62-bed inpatient behavioral health facility. I employ one person just to help me know what these are going to look like before I get a report back from CMS saying, you're not doing good, it's time for you to get better. One more person, we're up to 384. Then we have an ACO. And our ACO uh, is a Track 1 Medicare Shared Savings uh, program. We are in cycle two, year one. Uh, and in large part, this ACO is why primary care docs in Western North Carolina still have an option to practice independently you know that ACO reporting takes over for the enormous burden of MIPS. And so by playing in the ACO, by committing themselves to the quality improvement associated with that, 200 and some odd independent primary care docs in Western North Carolina stay independent. Now we report 34 metrics, and I know CMS has recently said that's gonna drop, but for the last year, 34 metrics. And we found challenges when we wanted to do that automated based on EMRs, and so in our opinion, We've had to uh, ensure that it's meeting the standard we want to go and do it manually. So we're talking about six to 650 person hours per year, again, just to do the reporting. We're up to 418 metrics, but anybody who knows anything about driving improvement means that you don't just do this once a year and spend 600 hours. I track 34 metrics times 1,000 plus network providers in order to actually drive improvement. So jumping out of the CMS world and into the rest of our payer metric universe, this is where you guys in the room begin having a pretty significant impact. And so if you look across the Western North Carolina market, we have commercial, employer, Medicare Advantage, you name it. We live in the value-based care world, 
uh, and have contracts ranging from strict P for P uh, metric based to sliding scale risk. And we have an enormous variability in how we're expected to report on these metrics and how our folks are attributed. So let's just start with attribution. The bullet points up there list various ways that payers across my space think about attributing beneficiaries to my docs. With some, it's whoever drops the most DNM codes, that's who gets attributed. Doesn't really matter if you're an ID doc or a cardiologist or a primary care doc. With some, it's auto assignment. And so my primary care docs might have patients they didn't even know were theirs because they've been signed up for but haven't actually come to our practice for many years. There's no consistency uh, in attribution and I employ folks within our provider quality reporting team uh, who go back and forth with our plans and just help us understand who our people are. An enormous amount of energy at health systems around the country spent in just figuring out who are the people we need to focus on. And then of course, there's definitions. Uh, it has warmed my heart over the last day and a half to hear that this matters as much to you as it matters to me. And that's when I drive something like A1C control, uh, today I've got no less than three different ways that we're asked to do that. We've got the standard less than eight, we've got less than nine, we've got the composite metric, and we've had challenges implementing CP22 coding, in part because there's limited consistency across the payer universe. Some folks ask for a charge in one way, some folks ask for it in a different way, and our revenue cycle folks say we're, we're not sure how to implement that. So again, we go back to manual reporting for much of the time. And different plans interpret the same measure differently, and that doesn't even get to the kicker, which is gap closure. And so I've heard, what is it, Workgroup 3B has spent a day and a half trying to concisely define a standard way to close gaps. Um, and I know you guys live in, in the payer world, and then you're regulated, but just to give you an example of what that looks like for us, so some folks require the screenshot method. And so I've got folks who go into our EMR, snap a screenshot, go into a portal, upload the screenshot, and then we move on from there. Others, it's the classic multi-million row Excel spreadsheet, right? And still others use the carrier pigeon method. Not as popular as you might think, but actually really, really effective. And I desperately want whatever laptop that pigeon is using because it looks like something, something I had in the 90s. And then of course, we're challenged with alignment. And so this is uh, from the, the CMS Resource Center. This is the, the blood pressure metric. And of course, they're saying in the numerator, we do not accept uh, folks who have, have readings from home. And then we move into HEDIS 2019 which says blood pressures taken from home can count. Same basic measure, two different universes, and that makes my team feel like this. <laughs> we're trying to get to the same thing and we're each dragging each other to get there. But as a result, we leave providers stuck in the middle today trying to do the same thing in three different ways. So what does this really mean? This is where, where we get into audience participation. So I come bearing a prize. Uh, it's low enough cost that those who work for the federal government can accept it. It's a hundred grand bar. <laughs> and so whoever can guess to the number exactly how many pay for value metrics one of my community medicine providers is responsible for at any given encounter wins 100 grand, but I promise you it's less than 100 grand, but probably not, not as, as much less as you would think. Take a guess. One of my primary care docs, how many measures are they responsible for in one patient encounter? What's that? Higher. Lower. What's that? Lower. Higher. I feel like Bob Barker up here. What's that? Higher. 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 Bingo. Oh. <laughs> 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 
My high school shortstop self is feeling really disappointed with that throw right now. 154 measures. 154 measures in a 15 minute 99213. It's a wonder they're burned out, right? That's what it looks like. I anonymize the plans atop, but this is what the reality of my primary care docs are living every single day. And these are the folks who work in a health system that has a very significant QI structure to support them. Imagine that two doc practice in Burnsville who doesn't. So those are just the things I'm required to measure. We haven't even touched on the things I measure because we're in this for the right reasons. This is our metric universe just looking at provider quality reporting, the things that we want to drive improvement on. It adds another 1,500 metrics to the list because I've got about 120 different practice types. I've got five domains that we measure and track in, patient experience, access metrics, quality metrics, safety metrics, and I employ another four or five people just to help manage that universe. We're up to 2,078 metrics and 17 people. And there's a whole bunch that I haven't counted. If you were to count all of the things on this list, operational measures, post-acute measures, home health value-based purchasing, the number gets to nearly infinite, and it touches every single person at Mission Health. So what have we done? Well, first of all, I have a job. Right? <laughs> 15 years ago, there weren't chief quality officers, in part because our providers need someone like me and a team to help make sense of this world. And believe me, I've drank the Kool-Aid, right? I'm the chief quality officer. I love metrics. I live continuous improvement. But it's my job to be the implementer, to be the filter between the world that we create here in this room and the folks who are accountable for driving interventions. I retweeted David's quote from yesterday because I thought it was superb. Measures in and of themselves have no intrinsic value. It's what you do with them that counts, right? They're like dollars in that regard. It's what we do with them that matters. So what, what have we done? We've taken as many of our metrics aligned in value-based care that we think matter to patients and matter to our providers and tried to crunch the universe as much as possible. Now our universe is 2,000 plus measures, so we haven't done a great job at that, but we keep trying. That's number one. We have built a system much like that I heard existed at, at Montefiore that lives in the home office and tries to take as much of the burden off of those who are at the bedside in a patient encounter as possible to help report on their metrics. We serve that out of a terrific team. Uh, Christina Van Regenmorder is the person in my group who runs that. Uh, she speaks the same language as I think Vanessa does from Mondofuer. If I put the both of them in a room, I think that it would be like nuclear fusion because really positive things would happen. We support that as much as possible, and then we've created a data-driven culture of continuous improvement, and I can't give a talk of any kind without touching on, on that briefly, so I'll spend just a, just a moment on how we operationalize driving metrics. On the clinical side, uh, we call those care process models. Uh, they're called that because my chief operating officer grew up in the Intermountain system, and that's the verbiage that they use. But think of it like a clinical pathway or care variation reduction, you know, whatever, whatever it is, right? So our care process model teams are led by a clinician. Uh, we support them from my shop with someone in PI, an analytics professional, an informaticist, pharmacy, nursing MAs, whatever the right group is where that pathway is gonna be used. We ask them to do their work now in 90-day sprints. So when I got to mission five years ago, these CPMs had the gestational period of like an elephant. It took them a year and a half to go from conception to delivery. Two years ago, we asked them to move to the gestational period of a scorpion and get them out in 90 days. And so we moved from one CPM every 45 days to one every 10. And that's what it's taken to keep up with the pace of change. We start by defining our best practice and that's evidence-based. I count on clinicians, I'm not a neurosurgeon, I'm not a primary care doc, I'm a neonatologist, to tell me what is the best practice. And then we have brilliant informaticians who speak the language of CDS hooks, who build that into our workflow. And that workflow is different for an inpatient neurologist than an ambulatory pediatrician. 
They build it into the workflow from a human factors perspective so it is like water flowing downhill and as easy as possible for the doc to follow the pathway and a little bit harder to not. We then measure it. And to me, this is really, really important. We serve in our analytics dashboards the ability to measure whether folks are using the pathway, and if so, what do their outcomes look like? And that makes all the difference in the world. So this is the example of the first sprint that we did. It was COPD exacerbation. Our chief of community medicine, Dr. Dowler, led it. And in 90 days, we went from across the board, grade variation, to a defined workflow in the ambulatory EMR, and we prevented at least eight ED visits and two inpatient hospitalizations. That slide was from a year ago. It is now much, much, much more. This is what the workflow looks like. It's, from what I'm told, simple to the primary care doc. I don't really understand what it says. Um, I don't give you know, babies a whole lot of, uh, of mucinex. And then this is where we measure it. So we're a, a EDW shop and served off of the EDW and click. This is one of our dashboards. You can see the entire practices utilization of every CPM in one shot. Those are my practices in the top left. And then you can see this is Dr. Dowler's individual performance on each and every CPM. And she let me use that because she, of course, is near 100%. But you can see even she has challenges with, um, with hypertension, maintaining utilization as high as it needs to be. This is the power of using an analytics platform to talk to docs. Once you get past the data's wrong, my patients are different, and you're showing me that my partner's outcomes are better than mine, none of us got into medical school being a B student. And you tell me I'm a B student? No, that's not possible. I need to be an A student. And six months of driving that with docs who have clinical gravitas and some professional relationships with their partners, that's how you get this over 80% in the course of a year. It has blown me away because we've done this in just about every clinical area you can possibly think of. We've done it in sepsis. We've done it in pediatrics. We've done it in surgery. I've got heart surgeons on board with this, cardiologists, orthopedic surgeons, you name it. We've done things that are easy, like normal term newborns, and we've done things that are really, really hard, like chronic pain. But the outcomes speak for themselves. We've had dramatic reductions in mortality dramatic improvements in population health outcomes like breast cancer screening, colorectal screening, you name it. Across the board, our teams have a lot to be proud of. And yet, you know we're talking apples and oranges because all of this outcomes data lives in my EMR and it doesn't make it to your claims. And unless it makes it to a claim, then our star rating is still X, and we have to go through screenshots, and we live in a universe where a shop like mine exists to prove my docs are getting these people to better outcomes. And that's what brings us to rooms like this today, and why I was so excited to get to speak to this group, because you can do something about it. And to me, the, the reason that you want to do something about it gets back to the why. In healthcare, measurement science didn't grow up talking about people. It grew up in manufacturing, in engineering, in aerospace, in nuclear power, in industries where we're talking about things, and things are not the same as babies. Babies are why I'm in healthcare, and I would argue it's why you're in healthcare. You came from whatever other industries, and someone in the back had worked in financial services, somebody else had worked in banking, you name it. You came here to help save people's lives. Now, I get that healthcare is expensive. I get that we spent over a trillion dollars on Medicare and Medicaid as of February. It was rising $2,000 per second, so it's got to be ridiculously higher than that already right now. And I get that we're not delivering a trillion dollars in population value. You look at our costs as a society, and we are among the highest in the OECD nation group. And then our population health outcomes are among the worst. My kids, who are four, six, and nine, have a shorter life expectancy than those born two years before. That is unacceptable. Our infant mortality rate is nearly double most other OECD nations. And the percent of our population with chronic disease is astronomical. 
that's why we need to do something about population health. But what we've done in the metric world, I think, has created a universe that makes it incredibly difficult to actually implement the interventions that we need to drive massive change in outcomes. The purpose of process and technology in healthcare, I would argue, is to scale the time that humans have to do what only human beings can do. I can build machine learning algorithms, and we've done it at Mission, to help my care managers find out who to focus on. It beats lace, it's terrific, it's up every morning at eight o'clock, but then I need care managers to focus on somebody. And the more time I give them to focus, the more joy they have in practice, because that's what they come to work for. By designing systems that give us tighter metric control, and by integrating scoring for those metrics into workflows, you are returning humanity to the practice of medicine. That's what we mean by interventions that reduce burnout. If you can give my docs and my nurses more time to spend with their patients and less time being data clerks, we will solve the problem of burnout in America in a heartbeat. So at the risk of, um, of overstaying my welcome, uh, here's my wish list. So at the top is simplify. Just for closing a gap on A1C, this is an example of the workflow that we need to follow today. It has to be done four times a year because we want to actually know whether our interventions are working over the course of a year. It's for an approximately 1,000 patient population. And just to submit the data to this particular plan, we're talking about one person working 24 hours a day for 33 days. We can do better than that. We need to focus on improvement first and accountability second. We need a parsimonious and universally applicable measure set. Right, this is my wish list, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm really shooting for the moon here. Universal alignment on things like attribution, definition, interpretation, and attestation. I don't think it's that hard to get to, and I'm really excited to hear that you guys are as energized about getting to that place as me. Functional eCQM reporting, multi-year metric updates so that we have time to drive improvement and make it harder and harder and harder each year, and of course, world peace. <laughs> but more than anything else, you guys are in the weeds in the best possible way of designing how we drive improvement in healthcare. And so my only ask for you, it, it's blown me away hearing the vocabulary and how much energy it takes to do this right, but remember the why. You are doing this to help people get better and to help people live healthier lives. We need terrific measures, we need the right interventions, and we need the space to implement them. So thank you for what you do. Thanks to Peggy and Michael for the opportunity to speak to the group today. And I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Chris, that was a best presentation. So good closer. Um, uh, my question, actually, I'm KP Sethi, work at Atlanta a Consulting Group. Uh, my question is about um, your process models, and you touched on it just a little bit, but did it help, or do you guys track how much time the physician actually now spends with the patient and not on their EHR? Yeah, so I, I wish I was at a place where we were better than the reported median, which is 50% of the time in an EMR. What I think we've been able to do with our care process models is limit the amount of hunting and pecking that our docs have to do, right? I, I can't reduce CMS's documentation burden for them. I can't change you know, the way that, that a 99213 has to be coded. What I can do, however, is make it really, really easy to order the antibiotics, order the fluids, 30 per kilo times three, order the right lactate, and then the automatic repeat for that lactate, so my docs are able to follow an evidence-based best practice in one click instead of 93 clicks. That's where we've found uh, a lot of improvement. And when we bring docs on from other systems, they go, oh my gosh, that's really easy. And, and that, I think, is, is a marker of a big difference.
you're really excited to get back to your work groups, right? I, I can tell. So I guess my question will be, which EMR do you use? And then how many additional software, you know, has a complement yeah. uh, to your EMR are you using? So Mission is a, a almost universal Cerner shop. I've got Cerner inpatient at each of our uh, acute care facilities and critical access hospitals, and then power chart ambulatory in our uh, primary care clinics. There are a couple of specialty clinics that are still on uh, a, a different EMR. If, however, you look across our network, so that now gets to all of the independent docs in Western North Carolina. Again, these are little one and two doc practices. They're on everything from amazing charts, exclamation point, to ECW, Athena, all scripts, you name it. I've got 14 different EMR products and 50 plus instances that we try to solve for. Our enterprise data warehouse is served by Health Catalyst, and then we predominantly use Click for visualization. Hello, I'm Mary Barton uh, from NCQA, and I'm curious about the people in the little box in the upper right hand corner. What would you like to redeploy them to do? So each of them comes to work because they want to help people. And so much like the care managers who, as a result of our data science uh, shop's efforts to build a readmission model, now get to spend less time combing through records to figure out which patients do I need to call and spend more time focusing on how do I make these people's lives better. I've got nurses and clinical analyst roles and folks across the infection prevention universe who want to be getting into clinicians' workflows at the bedside and implement things to make it better. The more energy and resource I have to drive interventions, the faster things will change. So that, that's where I would redeploy to. Hi, my name is Tiercy Fortenberry. I'm coming from Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Really appreciated your presentation. Many of those things resonate with us as well, so thank you for that. Um, I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about when you are boots on the ground, frontline operations, what are you finding with this work and team-based approaches, especially in your ambulatory space? What we're finding is, is a lot of work on clinicians. How can we think about team-based models a little bit more? Have you had any success in that, in that realm? Absolutely. I, I think if we are to meaningfully make any change in population health outcomes, it's not always going to happen in the four walls of a clinic. So first off, we've got to have the four walls of our clinic operating as efficiently as possible. We've got to allow everybody to practice at the top of their license. And in North Carolina, that means MAs are able to do things like diabetic foot exams. We've got to have our nurse practitioners practicing at the top of their license and our primary care docs doing the same. So our, our focus from a team-based model, uh, as folks come in and they do their huddle in the morning, is to ensure that everybody gets to do the maximal that they've been trained and are licensed and or credentialed to do. The second point is as we think about the move from um, you know, fee-for-service through the kind of inner space of value-based care to real risk-based population health, that then gets to teams that go well beyond those who practice healthcare. We're talking about community health workers. We're talking about community care medic programs. We're talking about intervening on health not necessarily intervening on care. And that is a wholly different view of the world. North Carolina will move into managed Medicaid in 2019. And our secretary has been very clear that that's what she expects us to be doing uh, as of 11-1-19, thinking differently about healthcare and not just intervening on care. I think they're ready to get back to their groups, Dr. Barr. 